I'm interested in the the way in which we lie to ourselves um, in order to tell a truth or our truth. But Mm -hmm. the first lie is that what we believe, what we think Mm -hmm. is divinely like given uh, is Mm -hmm. of God, not of man's making. So the first lie is that this isn't all arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's kind of the Saussurian um, linguistic uh, it by any other sign, we might have said the same thing, you know, by, you know, uh, uh, the, that the, within language, you know, like Nietzsche's approach to language is as a philologist, he's seen that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, it could be other words, but it's these words. And we forget that they're not the thing. Uh, we forget that they're linked up. Um, so the, the cost of our truth acts or our, our, speech acts which claim to say the truth are that we're denying that it's made up that it couldn't be something else in order to validate or legitimate the signs themselves plus what we say um Mm -hmm. it's 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 all power structures to cover over the first act which is kind of that it's it's which isn't magical Mm -hmm. and that comes at a cost and i mean for me then i think the cost I have to turn to winter and say, well, it's, it's colonization <laughs> it's the, is the, you know, it's at what cost is this truth, this truth system or this epistem premised. And it's on, it's premised on the com- commodification of human species, you know, into slaves in order to actually produce a society that benefits from this concept of man. Mm -hmm. um this it's the the cost is different in every age i guess but in in our age it's been um subjugation you know the cost of of being colonized Mm -hmm. that is the you know that's that's the that's what the mechanism is covering up it's covering up the myth making most essentially yeah it's a presumption of a transparency given by certain norms and laws that become the the given truth of what the word is Mm -hmm. and i think if we it's could it could it be said that there's something mimetic to the power of words that maybe comes from our indoctrination of the concept of logos which is something that philosophy continually tries to break apart but it's it's that the word is prior to everything that manifests Mm. And it's through word that we get um, all of our encoding and all of our um, culturation and all of our morality and all of our transcendental law. And in a sense, it is that kind of, I suppose, colonizing sense without, but you know, in a in a different way, I suppose. Um, or well, it's maybe a not colonization so. of nature in the first place. That's what he's saying here. Mm-hmm. You know, the 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 relation between world and word is already um, a, a, a subjugating one. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, he he. If we're not. Word... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. If we're if, not. If we're not acknowledging that the the word is appended. Yeah. If um and that other words might have been appended to it, um, you know this this relationship between the, you know what does he talk about the 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 sound that becomes an image like the mm-hmm. a nerve pulsation? What is the word he gives? I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, that's fine. I was vibing with what you were going with uh, he uses the concept he uses the word leaf as an example what what going back to what you're saying is modeled on on nature yeah the the, and, the leaf which stands for all leaves which supplants the individual actual instance yeah yeah um, by yeah. becoming a concept and so when we think of something like the divine, manifestation of word that comes through the mouth of christ as truth when you i think one of the things that's interesting about nietzsche is that he's not just a a critic of religion but he's concerned with how religion is going to be transformed into a non-religious ethics does that seem fair yeah and so 
if this divinity of word is so habituated and embedded in us in in a belief in something as powerful as the afterlife and salvation and forgiveness and then we try to transform that habituation into what people say in in everyday existence you know the the power of words and the the ability for words to attain power and the ability for power to gather words into something that does feel transcendental that does seem all encompassing um, then that has a powerful effect over the psyche mm. so i think that this transfer transformation of the divine word into um, the importance of words to replace nature to replace the i think what nietzsche and deleuze are both concerned with is the individual instance that has its own possibility like the individual leaf, right? Um, then that be comes to inform the idea of of truth, because in belief and in the habituation of belief, the concept overrides the instance. I found that text that I was trying to quote from. So what is a word? Page 55 in our version. It is a copy in sound of a nerve stimulus. Mm -hmm. And then again, later, uh, halfway through, down that page. Uh, to begin with, a nerve stimulus is transferred into an image. Mm -hmm. First metaphor. The image, in turn, is imitated in a sound. Second metaphor. Um, so these mm -hmm. these sound figures. Um, the this, but in both cases, we have the um, we have a kind of nerve stimulus mm. um, that and and a transfer. Yeah, transfer. So. Yeah, I think, but I think I the transfer of nerve or the transfer of stimulus would be that the word then takes on its own stimulation. Yeah, yeah, I think it does both, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think it has sound and image to it, um, but also that has nothing to do with the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so like we have a whole new world of words, mm -hmm. um, which is in concert with. The, the the world we've made words but mm. these are arbitrarily related but we think them to be necessarily related and if we don't if we don't if we're not acknowledging that they're arbitrarily related then we're lying to ourselves most essentially mm. i see yeah and that's the first lie um mm -hmm. but we do so in order to tell the truth about the words which is really more a song of a song or mm. you know a uh, a myth making it's a mm -hmm. mythos and you know the word made flesh mm -hmm. is mythic mm -hmm. but because of our belief in its relation to the world is magical mm -hmm. it's effective um and and it maybe we could also say um it imitates the world there's some relation between sound and image or experience of the thing and what we call it, um, it's not entirely arbitrary in our experience, but mm -hmm. now we're kind of in the Bachelardian world of like examining these different kind of sound units as worlds. Mm -hmm. Well, I think as well, you just made me think that if, you know, it, like so many mimetic processes that the copy takes on its own natural state mm -hmm. or presumed or believed natural state that gains its own power divided from nature. I think that was part of the Christian idea of the word yeah. and what a lot of people picked up on. And so once, because I think, and I think I'm resonating Nietzsche here, because of that, power is able to use language to grow itself. Mm -hmm. And that runs into the question then he asks is what what then is truth, which is his next question, can I, right? Can I interrupt there, though? Please because do. it grows itself mm -hmm. at odds with other languages, mm -hmm. other orderings, other structurings, mm -hmm. um, other systems, other cultures. Um, mm -hmm. And so part of what is at play in terms of how language evolves is it, you know, it, it, it evolves alongside or as a part of the growth of political global power. So mm -hmm. as English has, you know, colonized the world and as French and Spanish and 
Portuguese and Dutch have colonized the world, each of their representational systems or their, their epistems have also gone out into the world and creolized and nativized and and wordized the world. And they've done, you know, they've established their symbolic representational system as default um, yeah. for other language systems, other culture systems, you know, by, by threat of death, you know, with, with um, you know, power made through the barrel of a gun, you know, I'm thinking of Robinson Crusoe's Friday who worships the gun because of its magic and the gun seems like it's language too it's but it's specific language it's english you know it's um and, and it's every every language has a different way of establishing itself as as master um and in order to do so it has to it needs a slave so mm-hmm. i guess what i would say is each of these lang you know <clears throat> any the word made flesh this mythos, mythos is only as powerful as it can dominate other myths, other creation stories, other religions, other cultures. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's dominant, you know, it's um, our concept of, of, you know, of logos or our understanding of language as logos, I think is the predominant one in part because it's, it's beat out other master narratives. Mm-hmm. Now this uh, sounds like Roland Barthes using yeah, I mean, using I the it's... using the myth to overpower um, in order to tell a certain story that is of a dominant ideology. Yeah, I think just a, the the step between um, language to specific languages mm-hmm. is a big step, and I think it's he, Nietzsche does mention it briefly where he um, talks about the arbitrary assignments of gender. Um, he also talks a little bit about the various languages that play side by side, show that with words, it is never a question of truth, it's never a question of adequate expression. Um, otherwise, there would not be so many languages. So like that there's language, there's a war of languages or there's a power struggle among languages to be the dominant representational system. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not arbitrary that one becomes more dominant it's because of power and then that overlays the other metaphysical systems of those languages Mm -hmm. just like syntax is the order of the world and to the extent that we believe in language that's it becomes what we experience the certain order in and of words and world or how uh, the order of our experience and the order of the words that we use to represent it become almost anonymous in our experience. We can hardly tell them apart. Mm -hmm. If we bring this to today, I think one of the most effective uses of power is to project the idea of a translation Mm. so that all other languages can come to English and speak the language of commerce. And there you have globalization. And yeah. global capital, but that's I'm I'm but, projecting but, now into a new a new area, but yeah. One of the things in winter that I'm really interested in that she writes about in Black Metamorphosis, which like hasn't even come out in print yet, it's still in just a, a manuscript of a monograph. So Sylvia Winter is a Jamaican novelist, playwright, and critic maybe cultural critic or transcultural critic. She retired significantly early, like 20 years early, so she could write. Um, Mm -hmm. She like taught Mm -hmm. for a while, but she basically like converted her life into a writing life Mm -hmm. and produced this huge series of like really, really thick essays, like essays like uh, The Ceremony Must Be Found After Humanism and Ceremony Found, uh, where she is looking at um, man is an overrepresented word act that has gone through two significant epistemological sort of paradigmatic shifts. So she calls them events. So the first event um, is man coming to a consciousness of himself, herself, itself as man. And the second is, I think it's at the, the transfer of religion, uh, the desecularization of, of religion. So it's um, the birth of humanism. So like in the 16th century, 
and then the third event is kind of what she she looks to to Fanon as articulating and the third event is man taking off his mask or realizing um, that he's been masked and if he's been masked then he can remask himself um, so mm-hmm. it's that man has the creative capability uh, to reinvent himself herself itself mm-hmm. um, if we've been invented you know colonized by colonizer then we can reinvent ourselves the same tool that's been used to subjugate us, we can use uh, to self-realize or uh, self-determine. Mm-hmm. So that's the next event. Mm-hmm. And and she she goes back to Cesare and Fanon, especially, but to to a lot of other people. She reads Latour. She reads widely. She reads everyone. Mm-hmm. She, re- you know, she Heidegger is important to her. Cyril is imp- important to her. Uh, everyone. Uh, Althusser is super important to her. And then she reads throughout Black Studies, too. Uh, mm-hmm. So in any case, yeah, um, this this specific moment in her manuscript, Black Meta- Metamorphosis, which was an unpublished monograph that she wrote in the 1970s, it was born out of this essay that she wrote for the Jamaica Journal, I think it was in, in 1970, called uh, Junkanoo in Jamaica, where she was going back to Price Mars, Thus Spake the Uncle, and using what Price Mars had to say about Haitian culture um, as indigenized culture, as, as being indigenized to Haiti, even though it was African culture syncretized with Catholic culture that produced voodoo, because there was new culture produced between African uh, religious practices and Catholicism, Haiti was born as, Haiti gets its own roots. So this this process or theory of, of indigenization is that Price Mars talks about becomes really important for winter and talking about uh, the transplantation um, and indigenization of Africans in the Caribbean, throughout the Caribbean, that people become, they become from those places where they work the earth. So it's through working, it's through work, right? This is Hegel. Um, it's through work that we, there's there's the possibility of freedom or self realization. It's she calls this in, uh, indi- the process of indigenization. So yeah, that's so. If you imagine like a root being taken up from Africa, uh, planted in Jamaica, and then mm-hmm. enslaved uh, and worked for hundreds of years uh, through that work, the people became of that place. Uh, and that place became a root, like a uh, a source of a sort of a a, a nativization to to that land. Mm. So yeah, I, I I brought her up though because I was thinking about this question in Nietzsche and sort of what we're talking about as it concerns power and how languages are at war because cultures because there's a you know a, a survival of the fittest language at play, which is is also probably the survival of the, the greatest economy. I mean, I think that I, I feel like it's, I'm relating economy and languages quite a lot here. I think it's the language that wins out is the economy that wins out. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of how that's achieved, I think, it, and this is what brought this this question to mind is that Winter and Black Metamorphosis writes about this uh, at the initial trade between um, when countries began to gain their independence um, throughout the Caribbean. At the when they first started trading in the global market, there was a like a hundred percent uptick of the colonizers, whatever was being traded for, whether it was like coffee and you know gold or silver, silver or labor and bananas, there was always a doubling of, of the colonizer's price um, so that they always benefited from any exchange, whatever, um, mm. regardless of what's, what was being exchanged. And I, I kind of feel like that's what happens in language too, is that the economy of certain languages, uh, because it's in that language, it has an um, increase in value uh, because of its globality, I guess, in part, but also because of its the power that it is in relation with. Mm -hmm. Uh, But 
I feel like I'm getting into world system stuff and maybe mm-hmm. not enough Nietzsche and the, no, that's fine. I, I, what a word is. Yeah. I appreciate that. I, and I think you're right. I think, I think I agree with you. And, and I think it happens that, um, these kind of things can also crop up in local ways as well. Almost, um, almost like, uh, I don't know if, if, if another tribe was to suddenly crop up and it had its language and it had its control over say bananas or something like that, it would use its language. Um, is that fair to say, or do you think that it's more of a different? Well, I think of... that, I think any language is as powerful as its market. Yeah. So that's what uh, I would suggest. So political, economic, and value correspond to the the sense making system of any language, whatever. So there's mm-hmm. a there's an there's an essential relation between the you know how good a a, a language's economy is and how powerful a speech act from that language is. I think that mm-hmm. there's there's a relation there. I have to bring up another author. But Nikugu uh, Wationgo is a, a novelist and kind of maybe like a literary critic and has been, he just wrote a book on translations, uh, on translation called The Language of Languages. And I've been checking out his stuff and he was, he was talking about um, politics in, in Kenya specifically and how the language, the intertribal language uh, is, is English instead of being Swahili uh, because of the way that English has dominated politically remains the, the most effective means to continue to maintain political power. So like anytime a, po- a politician would give a speech, they give a, their speech in English because that's the language of the colonizer, but it's also the language of governance and con- social control in terms of the experience of of the colonized people of Kenya. So I guess what I'm saying is that language, I think the languages that we speak associate certain worlds that we experience and and how we value, um, overvalue or undervalue a language has a lot to do with what social power we gain or stand to lose by speaking it. So if we want to dominate, then we use a language which corresponds most closely with the dominating languages. Well, a couple of things come to mind. I mean, in one sense, thinking about what you said about winter, is is it possible that there is a a way of taking back the the language in a local sense if you hmm. if you do have the economic base? Of course, in a global situation, that's very hard yeah, to maintain. Yeah. But but I wonder if there's a yeah. if there's a little rupture yeah. opportunity there. There is. And... But then in a global system, I would think, and just thinking about what you said about English as being the, the language that would be spoken in a academic sense rather than Swahili, it's that's probably because of the supremacy of, you know, white white domination in exactly. academia and also in the global communications infrastructure with the yeah. internet yeah. and things like that. These are just further manifestations, I think, of Nietzsche's idea though. So what Winter has to say is is exactly or, or lines up really well with what you're saying or what you're suggesting. Um, and she points to, you know, Bob Marley and mm-hmm. relation to Garveyism um, and reads really closely the writings of Eldridge Cleaver and is like deeply entrenched in like the black power movement, like really committed to the ideas and the practices. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think what she what she finds is and the opportunity for rebellion, revolution is always possible uh, within the the colonies. So I think it, you know, the example of Haiti, I think is is one of the examples that, you know, that she goes back to and a lot of the people who she reads, CLR James and, and others go back to a case study in how to get free. Part of part of how they did it was um, she talks about is that every um, slave had a had a their own plot that they could grow their own food on. Um, mm-hmm. So that little plot is the part of where it's that bit of that part of that little part of earth that you can locate yourself. Um, and if you can locate yourself in relation to the earth, then you have the possibility of 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 connecting to the ancestors. 
especially if that site is funeralized or um, activated through cultural ceremony. Um, Junkanoo is a, a, a dance that's born out of the a kind of like funeral mode, but it, it, it's, it's kind of a reinvocation of the ancestors um, by way of a backward glance. So for all the, the, all the disconnection between uh, oneself and one's culture, oneself and one's language, especially in the case where your languages have been erased and your history has been erased and your names have been taken, um, there's, there's a, an opportunity still for reinventing yourself. But doing so in relation with the ancestors, insofar as you can connect to the ancestors through that little plot of land where you grow your yams, um, and when you when your yams are harvested, then you you would celebrate Junkanoo. And and that relation with eating the yams and relating with the ancestors is is all sort of tied in for her to the possibility of even within a colonized language speaking your original tongue. So this possibility of decolonization, disalienation within a colonized, alienated prison of the body. There's a distinction between inner freedom and outer freedom. And, and I think what Winter wants to point towards is that we can use, and that plot of land gives her an example for is how an inner freedom can actually grow into an outer freedom. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, she builds her whole theory on the writings of um, Cabral. I don't know if you know Amil Carr mm-hmm. Cabral, um, but in, in his book or in his speech, National Liberation and Culture, um, from February 20th, 1970 or so. Um, he writes, um, whatever may be the condition of a people's political and social factors in practicing this domination, it is generally within the culture that we find the seed of opposition, which leads to the structuring and development of the liberation movement. Mm. So the, the seed of opposition is always located in culture. So mm. if a country wants to, if a culture wants to, colonize another culture it supplants the culture but the seed of its opposition is always there so Mm -hmm. um, the possibility of of liberation or speaking one's own language within a colonized language is still available within the colonized language but it has to grow that outer experience political freedom and this gets into rent too um, that political freedom is grown out of um, a mental freedom uh, a mental emancipation um, Sounds very Hegelian as well. It's it's all Hegelian. It's all Hegel. Mm-hmm. The and it's also Marx too, for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. It's 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 Hegel. Mm-hmm. Interesting. But the but I guess just to answer your question, we can um, we it's possible because of because of um, cultural production because of the creative act. What's possible? liberation mm-hmm. within a, a colonized form, within a colonized land, within a colonized language, within a colonized culture. Um, freedom's possible because of poetry and dance and music, mm-hmm. but yeah, maybe only maybe, because maybe. of it. I think that, yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think it grows out of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like for culture for, is such a dangerous word as well, but I, now I understand what you mean by you're not talking about culture war kind of talk you're talking about actual poetics and making things through movement and expression and art that kind of culture that kind of cultural you know we unfortunately get weighted down by these words like culture and cultural production but that kind of poesis i guess of Mm. of making something from out of the culture yes yeah yeah okay and as it concerns the the question of culture wars i mean i think that there's there's there is a relation here. Um, yeah, there is something. And, and maybe that's it, why the battlefield is being fought. <laughs> but um, but I think before we can talk about the wars, I think we have to figure out how each culture in and for itself establishes itself as a culture um, within its within its transnational borders, mm-hmm. uh, but also how now those this- have grown. Mm-hmm. Well, now this would make me think of Deleuze and Guattari's yeah, idea of a minor I'm, literature. I'm totally, you know, I, so the, I, that the minoritarian is, exactly. is not is not so much. Um, now they they're taking a non-Hegelian 
approach in that the 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 minor is not opposed to the major but within the major the minor expresses itself from out of that by using its own language being housed within the dominant language mm-hmm. that's the way i understand the minoritarian yeah, yeah. expression yeah. so that's another way of kind of approaching that idea of yeah. of that i think i think what i haven't said clearly enough to try and sum up all the people i've been calling up is that i feel like there is this possibility of free speech in occupied territory yeah i don't know if free speech is it though maybe it's but i mean parole libre like the 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 uh the Fou- the Foucaultian concept of free speech um fearless speech uh speech that liberates speech that is free but, um, and so here i would also think of you know like lotremont and I don't know the the Marquis de Sade. You know, I think that there's okay <laughs> dangerous there's speech. Kind of there's a kind of freedom to to reveal, and also the the necessity of philosophy to say everything, mm-hmm. not to censor itself. But then we have to reckon with everything. Yeah, the idea of of a free speech is is has really changed its language since we've been indoctrinated to that idea of free speech because in in the sense of how we and this returns us to where we started which is the habituation of terms mm. so free speech we've been indoctrinated habituated to believe that everyone in America for example uh, has freedom of speech the freedom to to speak and i think if we think of it in that way in that container of what that meaning houses and the kind of aluminum casing that that uh captures the word in the that empty husk <laughs> <laughs> yeah that it uh it becomes something of well sure everybody can say what they want kind of idea mm-hmm. when free speech is is not what we are getting in a in a sense of i i know, think we kind are of, actually. kind of well, it's a, a sense of con- well. Just to finish the thought, that there's that there are forces that are not so played out in the in the court of law in terms of infringing on freedom, mm-hmm. but but a kind of ment- a, a psyche that there mm-hmm. are reformulations of the psyche. And I don't want to sound conspiratorial, but how how things just kind of move to contain thought so that its freedom is something that is agreed upon. Mm-hmm. Which I think is a danger, and it and it does not leave room for the kind of thing that you are saying. I th- I think what I mean to say is who is free to speak freely. Actually, I think that when we talk about free speech, everyone, not all bodies, are as equally free to speak freely. Um, so I think that. Can you give an example? I just want to know where you're coming from with that. Yeah, I mean, I I think um, as it concerns protest. I'm thinking of uh, Judith Butler's The Force of Nonviolence. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of Walter Benjamin's Critique of Violence. He writes about how there's these two forms of lawmaking that uh, political power has the right to make. So it's it has the right to make laws as well as the right to interpret how those laws, what those laws mean, um, or how those laws can be applied. So in the case of a police officer um, pulling over a, 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 a person um, in a vehicle, they have the right by their, you know, by, by the, the laws to, you know, if they, if they see something that they want to respond to, they, they have the right to, to do that within the laws. Within the laws, there are certain rights that, you know, that whoever is pulled over have too. Uh, mm-hmm. But in, in terms of um, law making and law preserving um, powers in the critique, the interests of the state are always to protect its power. Um, so how it how it applies um, the law preserving acts are are in order to uh, constitute the law. So uh, how you know so if a police officer stops and frisks a person on the streets of New York and and that's within the law then there's nothing wrong there. 
but it's also within the law for them to determine where and when to use that law. And, it, and it's in the interest of the state that it would um, use the opportunity to interpret the law as a way to defend itself. Mm-hmm. Um, so whatever are its interests. So if, if you have protesters on the state steps in Michigan um, who happen to be white and are holding guns, that doesn't threaten us, you know, the state because they're representative of the state. But if those are Arab or Muslim appearing people with guns on those same steps, then that's terrorism. So how the state interprets the law is the law that is making. Um, and it has that right mm-hmm. uh, to protect its own interests uh, mm-hmm. as it defines itself. And it defines itself out of its history, you know, out of mm-hmm what it's been for the last 300 years, where it came from, whose mm-hmm. interests were first invested in it, uh, mm-hmm. how it constitutes itself. This is a charged topic. It is. Yeah. And and I think you're broadening the, the idea of speech, but then that does bring us in line with the idea of not only speech, but the symbols and the, the semiotics of power um, yeah. that reinforce the myth and um exactly. yeah, in that in that sense i'm with you but i do think that there is the thing that that i'm that concerns me is that i do think that in the example that you stated there are others who can come along and speak to that power the problem is i don't know that the speaking is enough when it's always so this is this is kind of the the kind of question that i might have for someone like some of the writers that you've been talking about is if the and this is, I think, part of my problem with dialectics is if it's always within the structure of the dominant culture that resistance happens, then dialectically it always seems to come back to reinforcing the the existing power structure rather than yeah um, getting outside of it or or um, transforming it. I I think mm-hmm. and then again, we could fly off into a whole other area. I think that the problem of this is that if you want to sort of line up the different structures of power, um, one of them is to think of someone like Cornell West, just that the language itself is embedded in traditionally white power um, as as a language. So you always have to speak within that. Mm-hmm. Um, another problem I think is that the internet is built on, or it has transformed itself into what you were talking about earlier, which is this English language economics that sets the parameters of discourse that are hard to get out of. So mm-hmm. the problem I see is, is in, if we are stuck in these, and then to bring us, I guess, to circle back to what we were talking about at the beginning, if it is that we have internalized and habituated these beliefs from the words that we have that we don't even question. It's like a fish in water. It's just the water that they swim in, that we swim in. Then is being inside of it the way of transforming? Or is there something that needs to come in a post? Are we talking, are we taking Nietzsche's ideas and are we talking about something that has to come in a post Hmm. um, electronic world? Or I don't know. That's just an open question. Yeah. And an impossible one to answer, I know. I mean, there, I... There's all sorts of things to play with there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think that there is, um, going back to one of the earlier points there, whatever tools or methods we use to liberate ourselves will be used to destroy us tomorrow. Um, so like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's that's how capitalism works. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have to be nimble. Um, we have to keep moving. Mm-hmm. We have to keep and, creating. I think like and, you can't get free to, you know, today, how you got free yesterday. It's just yeah, not. Right. And if I think of the most effective protests that have happened, things like, and it's always in its earliest stages. If I think of the uh, umbrella protests in Hong Kong, if I think of Black Lives Matter early on, if I think of Occupy Wall Street early on, before the lang- the language of media and corporate media and again that economic structure of mm-hmm. uh, power decided that it needed to codify 
the rules and the standpoints of people who are, like you said, just moving and being fluid. You know, once once the media comes in and defines the terms, that's when the fluidity falls apart. And so to your point, I think, yeah, you need to be nimble. You need to keep moving and keep creating. Yeah. Also, I think we need to get, like we we're doing earlier, really um, aware in terms of what you're saying, if we're all we're all swimming in language or if we're all in the prison house of language mm -hmm. um, to go back to Jameson, who um, mm -hmm. I feel is a sort of shadow figure in this conversation too. We don't all live in that prison the same. <laughs> it's we yeah, we're, true. we're, there's different yeah. laws that um, apply to, to each of us. And, and that determines sort of our, the fluid dynamics of how we, manage and are managed by language, whatever mm -hmm. language we're, we're working in. Um, it's the same as being, you know, being at the, at being affected by the sort of social, ontological, political forces in any culture. Um, language and culture, you know, are, are enfold each other, I think, in this way, or mm -hmm. co-create each other in this way. Well, it's chemical. It's the, it needs to be chemical. It needs to be constantly running different. Yeah different fluids in the, in the Bunsen burner, you know? Yeah. But I think that, I mean, per our sort of, uh, and you know, where we often line up is this imperative to create um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for our, for our um, thinking, for our writing, for our, uh, for our movements to keep regenerating, uh, re yeah. keep reinventing itself. Because I think that's in, in part where the, you know, the, to get at the transcendental that you're, pointing mm -hmm. towards, um, if it, you know, it's, 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 I'm thinking of Heidegger's, uh, only the gods can save us now, only a God can save us now. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm thinking of, of the end of Freud's, um, civilization is discontents where he's like, mm -hmm. you know, man, will man destroy m man because of all of this, you know, aggression and all of this drive to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the truth drive becomes the, the, <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Destructive principle. Yeah. Um, Self-destructive principle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like there's a demand now to, and, and it has been going since perhaps 2016. That, at least for me, is 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 this need to codify one's moral standing, mm. and then and then maintain it, mm. and use that as the, and and then find the others who also are that, and then yeah. to oppose what is opposite to that. And, and that's just not creative. Yeah. I, I feel like for myself, um, politically and creatively more and more, I'm trying to just like work my little plot of land and grow some yams <laughs> so I can potentially like have <laughs> a, the yams. a, a, a yeah. ceremony. <laughs> like, I feel like it's like, what is, what is the it. basic food of freedom? You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a root, yeah. uh, but it's, it's that's great. Like it's where can I just like too. cultivate some little part mm -hmm. of, of regenerative life-giving humanizing growth again? Like where I feel so dead in capitalism and so exhausted mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in this representational too. system that I, I think everybody call. is. Yeah. Yeah. This it becomes work when you exactly. live in it. Um, and then yeah. can you get free within the same stuff? Like back to the empty husks, it, it can just become totalities. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, all that empty husking is really disembodying after a while. Um, and even if you're talking about getting free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think for me, it's, um, and I think one of the things that resonates with me with Nietzsche and, and one of the reasons why I like talking about him and talking about him with you is perhaps I'm, I'm different from you in that I just want to keep antagonizing things. I'm, I'm very much, I've become much more, of an antagonizer, mm. uh, a, a creative, hopefully um, joyful antagonizer to mm. go with Nietzsche's idea. But sometimes I, I fail fly. at that. You could mm. be his gadfly. Yeah. I fail at it often because I get frustrated. But um, to me, antagonization is necessary. And I think that we're, mm. we're feeling a loss of that sense because it's mm. become something associated with aggression. Well, and that's disappointing. Yeah, well, it is sometimes aggressive. Yeah, and yeah. I guess my question would be like, what are all the ways in which it forms of engagement or response or like? I guess I, it, I'm thinking about the difference between criticism and 
critique mm-hmm. is like what and and um some of what you know the terms we don't like are like having to describe you know like having to to like just remain in this level of summation and and mm-hmm. re-articulation that never gets to a kind of creative act of an original act of thought thinking with and thinking from the materials the historical materials that we've inherited in this you know, historic moment that we can everything we can think with mm-hmm. um, all the thinkers all the thoughts all the articulations as mm-hmm. music to riff off of and to play with and also sometimes accidentally to stumble on something new probably the most joyful part about all of it for me is the doing it together like yeah i think that it's music it's a kind of music mm-hmm. Um, that's most enjoyable when played together. Mm-hmm. 